why don't we start with a bit of diagnosis? What's wrong with higher education? What's wrong with the academy? Give us, just give it to us as straight as you can and take as long as you need. Well, it's abdicated its responsibility to infuse students with the sense of their extraordinary privilege to be reading works of utter sublimity. The faculty should approach these works with love, gratitude, and a sense of joy. And they have one responsibility, to cram as much knowledge of greatness and of our inheritance into students' empty noggins as possible in four years. Instead, they're teaching students to hate, to hate the greatest works of Western civilization and to hate, frankly, each other because the reigning ideology on campuses is that of victimhood. And students are immediately categorized from the moment they step on a campus as either belonging to the high status victim groups or the oppressors. Uh, and, and they go through the next four years seeing things through that lens of victimhood and oppression, which is a tragedy and an extraordinary loss of opportunity. To me, I think this has happened, this is mostly characteristic of the humanities and to a lesser degree of the social sciences, but increasingly will become characteristic of the STEM fields because they're under assault, I would say, by the same agents who undermine the humanities and the social sciences. And I would say of all the dangers that um, the current situation in the university presents that's probably the, the one that's primary because so far the STEM fields have remained relatively, let's say, unviolated by the intellectual corruption that characterizes the other disciplines. And they're, they're of crucial importance, obviously, practically speaking but also as a bulwark against the ideological pathology that currently passes for academic knowledge in, in, a, in the institutes of higher education. Um, what's wrong exactly? I, I see it, I really see it as a continuation of a process that was identified by both Nietzsche and Dostoevsky at the end of the 19th century, that it's a, it's a continuation of the collapse of, the collapse of the idea of God, or collapse in the belief in God, or maybe if you thought about it psychologically, as a collapse in the archetype of divine masculinity. That's another way of thinking about it. I mean, Nietzsche warned that if we lost our fundamental foundation block, which was the notion of, 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 a, of, a, of a transcendent divinity, that we would degenerate in two directions, one direction being nihilism and the other direction being its, its twin, its malformed twin, totalitarianism. And that was his diagnosis for the 20th century. And I think that's exactly what happened during the 20th century. Uh, it's a diagnosis of stunning accuracy, especially given how relatively early in the 19th century it was made. And Dostoevsky, for his part, made exactly the same case, uh, particularly in, in um, The Devils, The Possessed, the books variously titled. Um, which is a study of the corrosive effects of really uh, of an ideology very, very similar to the one that reigns today in the university campuses. Um, the Devils is, is uh, a literary work that describes the intellectual and moral genesis of exactly the type of thinker who caused the catastrophes of the Russian Revolution. It would be 30 years later, I guess. So it's another work of incredibly prescient insight, um, almost incomprehensible. With the loss of that 
See, the problem with the loss of that idea, and I'm, I'm speaking psychologically, I would say, which is what I try to do as much as possible, is that there, regardless of your religious belief, you cannot exist outside a hierarchy of value. It's not technically possible. You need a hierarchy of value to organize your perceptions. And I, 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 mean this, I mean this literally, I mean this neurophysiologically, in that even when you're observing the world, which, as far as you're concerned, merely manifests itself for your observation, you're focusing, your eyes are engaged in a series of complex movements that are controlled by unbelievably complicated neuro, neurophysiological circuits. And you focus on something and not on everything else. And that means that you pick something out of the almost infinitely complex realm of potential phenomena as of signal importance. And that orients your very capacity to observe the world. And that hierarchical structure that guides your perceptions is, is of unbelievable depth and complexity. Because you you tend to attend to those things that, let's say, you regard as important. They're going to further you in life. So you need a philosophy of what constitutes furtherance in life, which implies a gradient between what's undesirable and what's desirable. And that, that structure, that gradient of undesirable to desirable, is in fact the philosophical manifestation of the neurophysiological hierarchy that enables you to parse the world up so that it's comprehensible. And something has to be at the top of that. Well, it, it doesn't, because you can be a war, you can be an internal war of conflicting values. That's the alternative. But that's not um, psychologically acceptable. That that's, would manifest itself in uncertainty and anxiety and directionlessness and hopelessness and nihilism to be a house that's divided amongst itself. All of that needs to be oriented into a hierarchy that's a unity and something has to be at the pinnacle of the hierarchy because otherwise it's not a hierarchy. And, and the question is, well, what is it that might be at the pinnacle? And, and that is the question. It's, it's the question, right? It's, it, because what's at the pinnacle is that to which all of your resources should be fundamentally devoted. And what we decided in the West over thousands of years, and, 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 I, and I would say beginning far before Christianity, was that there was an ideal mode of being that's expressed in the idea that human beings have a spark of divinity within them. And that, and that manifesting the personality that would be the most genuine embodiment of that spark of divinity constitutes the highest of possible goals. And, you know, you can, you can simplify that idea. You can say, well, you know, you, you, you have an ethical responsibility um, to manifest what's best in you to manifest your potential, people speak in those terms, and to become more than you are, to become who you could be. But lurking underneath that is this idea of the ideal, the, the ideal, the embodied ideal, or even the incarnate ideal, because this is something that's not merely an abstraction, it's something that's expressed in flesh. That's the idea of the word made flesh, let's say. That's, a, that's part of the same set of ideas. And that, that, that ethical proposition is that, I, th I, th I think it's expressed well in, in the earliest chapters of Genesis. The ethical proposition is something like, th there's, a, there's an action in the world, there's an action in being that's characterized in Christianity as logos. And it's the operation of truth and courage nested in love on potential. So the idea in Genesis is the world springs into being in some sense as a consequence of the action of this logos. Uh, 
and that if the logos is operative on potential then what emerges as a consequence is good by definition so that's an ethical it's an ethical axiom, it's a daring ethical axiom it, it, it's, it's, it's one of the most daring ideas I've ever come across because it's, it's a very daring idea to, to state to posit because in the absence of proof except that which you would gather as a consequence of enacting the proposition that if you act courageously and you tell the truth then what you bring into being is by definition good it often doesn't look that way, you can get into a lot of trouble by telling the truth and so it's very easy to take the easy way out in the short term that, that's the characteristic of God himself and, it's, and the logos is the characteristic of the, the logos is the definition for the process that undertakes that extraction from potential and its transformation into reality and then there's the secondary proposition that well, human beings are made in the image of God and I believe, and I also believe this as a scientist that there isn't a more accurate way of describing what we do as conscious beings you know, you, you hear that if you're an adequately informed scientific materialist that it's incumbent on you to note that human beings are fundamentally deterministic in their behavior but the evidence for that, I would say, is not strong the conceptual evidence is strong, because you can make a coherent argument but the actual evidence is rather weak because it isn't obvious at all that we can act deterministically except when we've done things that we've practiced intensely but that isn't the way that the world manifests itself to us in many ways what, what seems to be the case instead is that we wake up every morning and what faces us is the unformed future that's the reality that we confront, it's not the present and it's not the past it's what could be that day and, and, and we see that as a, as a field of possibility all of which could conceivably be manifested but none of which has yet been manifested and, and, and then we feel called upon as, as, as the action of our life to chart a course through that multitude of potential paths to select from among all those possibilities the realities that we choose to bring into being and then to work to bring them into being and we also recognize and we treat each other like this that the quality of what it is that's brought into being as a consequence of those choices is directly dependent on the ethical integrity with which we conducted ourselves while making those choices which is why we can wake up at three in the morning and berate ourselves for having made a mess of the week or the day or the month or our lives because we understand that we deviated from the appropriate path and we call ourselves out on it like we call out the people we love and the people that we have relationships with and that idea is, is that's that idea that idea of hierarchy and the divine spark of consciousness and its relationship to ultimate reality and, and to metaphysical reality that's fundamentally what's under assault at the universities it's well, far deeper than the political it's, it's, it's with great trepidation that I would take any exception to Jordan Peterson especially in his field of work um, and so I'm just going to offer an alternative possibility without in any way negating your profound insights when it comes to the university when it comes above all else to the humanities I think it is possible to approach this extraordinary civilizational inheritance that it is the purpose of education to pass from one generation to another uh, without necessarily grounding that in a metaphysical conception of God uh, or even believe it or not a unitary truth and, and I take for me the model of humanistic learning the Renaissance humanists who rediscovered the classical legacy that had been 
nearly buried uh, throughout the early period of Christianity in the Dark Ages. Renaissance humanism began with Petrarch's discovery of Livy's monumental history of Rome and Cicero's letters, which would go on to inspire the American founding fathers with their lucid prose and insights into political organization. And this triggered an extraordinary appetite, a passion to find again a civilization that the Renaissance humanists found expressed things that was beyond their current horizons. Petrarch felt so intimately involved with these writers that he was discovering, and they were, the humanists would travel across Europe going to monasteries in mountains to try to recover these moldering manuscripts of Quintilian or, or Plautus. Cis, Pl Petrarch was so engaged that he wrote letters to the classical authors. He wrote letters in Latin to Virgil and Ovid and to Cicero and, and to Homer, although in Latin because he didn't speak Greek to his utter despair. And he wrote one letter to Cicero rebuking him for the vindictiveness that he came across in one of his letters. And it, it, it wounded Petrarch to the core uh, because he had formed this ideal vision of this ma monumental Roman order. And then he thought better of himself. And he wrote another letter to Cicero saying, I apologize, but I just was so, so upset. But you have to understand, it's because I love you so deeply. That spirit of discovery, of passion, of belief in beauty, I think can go on without necessarily being grounded in a transcendental metaphysics. Now, of course, I would grant the humanists were themselves Christian, uh, but there is an entire range of Western civilization, the extraordinary evolution of the 19th century novel. I've been pondering a lot recently the drama of the evolution of human style, of whether it's in music, the evolution from the 18th century opera seria that was all operas written in highly allegorical form to the late 19th century verismo, or the, the mysterious evolution from the medieval allegory, the troubadour poetry, uh, Spencer's Fairy Queen, where it was absolutely taken for granted that literary expression, the expression of the most eloquent among us, would be couched in terms of abstract allegorical figures. How did we get from there to the great flowering of the 19th century British novel and of French novel? That is an amazing transition and an amazing evolution of the possibilities of human expression. And I think it's the purpose of the university, separate from, it can incorporate a religious faith. And certainly, our universities in America in particular were grounded, in, and in Europe, were grounded in a Christian faith. Uh, but they can also proceed simply on the basis of the joy of exploration and infusing in students a sense of human accomplishments that would otherwise be completely outside of their kin. It's interesting. You know, I just had a discussion with Steven Pinker two days ago. And Pinker makes a case, I would say, that's quite similar to yours, being an, a very, someone who's very, um, uh, let's say, fond of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. and, um, I am too. That, that's, that's, and, and I mean, I, I, I don't have any uh, quarrel with that, except that I think that one of the things that has let, laid us open to what's happened in the universities is our inability as a culture to weave together the relationship between the enlightenment that you speak of and the deeper underlying metaphysic from which it emerged. And 
I think the fact of that fracture, which would be at least in part the fracture between science and religion, is one of the causal factors that's led to the rise of the kinds of ideologies that we're talking about as being destructive in the universities. So, Possibly. Um, I mean, we've, we've, we've lived with the Enlightenment for a long time. You know, we've, we've, we've had two centuries now. We can argue about whether rationalism is to blame for Nazism. I would agree not. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that we had an Enlightenment philosophy. I mean, my, my word, when you think of the, uh, the German philosophers that were passionate about truth, I, I would put Hegel in the in Enlightenment category. I would put Kant there. Now, they were not necessarily agnostics, but, but I think that uh, a, a belief in the powers of reason, in the powers of exploration, uh, can be perfectly consistent with a reverence for the past and a joy of learning. I don't think it necessarily leads you towards nihilism, although I would also say one of the uh, reflexive so-called conservative critiques of contemporary academia is to say, well, it's all from nihilism or it's all from relativism. If only, I mean, the, the problem with these student yahoos is not that they are uh, sort of uh, abstractly and aloof from any passion f and zealous passion for truth. They are utterly convinced that they are in possession of the single acceptable truth about Western civilization, which is that it is fundamentally racist and sexist at its core. They admit no doubt. They admit no discourse. Uh, so we do not have in the university today the instantiation of an Enlightenment ideal. To the contrary, we have the assumption that discourse is equatable with hate speech. And once you forswear discourse, you are left with one option, which is brutal force. Is it or to, submission. Or, well, mm -hmm. of course, but to somebody else's force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether this is a good uh, moment to bring up the whole status and uh, fact or possibility of freedom of speech. Because there is very much dominant in the academy at the moment, as you just alluded, Heather, to the, uh, the idea that somehow the protection of the vulnerable or oppressed is incompatible with freedom of speech. And I think this might be a way of, as it were, uh, uh, brooking what is uh, an apparent divide in your analysis uh, insofar as, as, as we might ask whether freedom of speech gets at anything or whether there's, a, there's any world out there to know. Um, uh, and so to return to this question of the status of free speech within the university, I just want to read a, a, an absolutely beautiful quotation from your recent book, uh, Heather, which moved me very much. It's one I hadn't encountered before by Frederick Douglass from 1860, in which he says, slavery cannot tolerate free speech. Five years of its exercise would banish the auction block and break every chain in the South. Now, I don't think I can even begin to imagine from my position of, of peace and relative prosperity and liberty how vast was the power Douglas thought freedom of speech carried. And so I'm wondering if, if we could talk a bit about uh, what the consequences of, of, a, of, a, of an oppression of freedom of speech is on campus, but also, conversely, what liberating, enlightening power okay. freedom of speech opens up. Well, first of all, what needs to be underscored here is the extraordinary ignorance that underlies these students' contempt for freedom of speech. Nobody who has the most foggy connection to the history of tyranny the world over, who understands, as Douglas said, that freedom of speech is the right that tyrants first of all destroy because 
they understand that it has the power to challenge their authority. These students are not only historically ignorant about the fact that it is minorities who depend, above all else, on an ability to speak outside of accepted norms that, is a, that are oppressing them, but they're also unable to think abstractly. So let's forget the past, and let's just think in the present moment. Uh, you know, one of the key functions of thinking is to reverse positions. To, to, you know, Rawls talks about the original position. What arrangement of rights would you choose if you don't know your status when you're first born? So if you don't know if you're going to be the one with power or the one without power, do you want freedom of speech or not? So right now, the student censors, the progressive yahoos on campus, are the ones that control the power to define what is hate speech and thus what is prescribable. Do they want to give that power to our current president? I know Stephen didn't want to get into politics here, so I'm not even going to name him. <laughs> but there is a certain president at this very moment that is not exactly welcome on college campuses. His very name causes emotional breakdowns. Uh, did these students not understand that they are setting a precedent that can be used against them? They think they will always have power. Maybe, sadly, they will. Let's hope not. Uh, but, but they are unable to think abstractly in terms of general principles and precedents that can be used against them. As for the power of speech, yes, it's important. I would just add as an addendum that we can return to. I nevertheless think that conservatives are making a mistake by grounding their analysis of what's wrong with the university almost exclusively in terms of the violations of free speech. I think mm -hmm. there is something far more important than debating opinion in a university, and that is, again, the transmission of knowledge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for which debate is sometimes relevant, but not always. So I should clarify something. I mean, in, in my initial <coughs> comments, I wasn't making the case necessarily for a religious viewpoint. I was making the case for the necessity of a hierarchy of ethics and that at the pinnacle of the, ethic, of the ethical hierarchy is a conception of the, the sovereign individual, we'll say. And I think that you can make that case psychologically and you can make it metaphysically, but you don't have to make it metaphysically. It's, it's, it's not, let's say it's optional. I'm not convinced necessarily that it's optional, but I think you can make that case. But something has to occupy that high position psychologically to, to organize you. And it's, it's out of that concept that we have this creative capacity to interact with the world and to bring it into being as a consequence of our ethical action that gives rise to the notion of the sovereign individual. And the sovereign individual, in my estimation, is the proper category for apprehending the human being. And there are presumptions that go along with the idea of the sovereign individual, and those presumptions are that, well, first of all, that you're an individual and not defined by your group identity. You may have a group identity. In fact, you do. You have multiple group identities, which is a problem that even the identity politics people have great difficult great difficulty dealing with conceptually. But your group identities are to be regarded as secondary. There's something to you that's unique to you that's of fundamental intrinsic value. And the fact that it's unique and of fundamental intrinsic value is actually what makes free speech of fundamental value. And you see, the debates on campus aren't about who should speak. That's not the problem. That, that's to radically underestimate the danger of the philosophical argument. The argument on campus is that 
There is no such thing as free speech. And the reason for that is that for there to be free speech, well, first of all, there have to be sovereign individuals who have experiences that are grounded in truth, that are unique to them, that can be shared with other people of goodwill through dialogue, and that the consequence of that can be something approximating um, a novel and negotiated peace. Novel because something new has come into being, and negotiated because sovereign individuals of, of value have engaged in a process that enables them to come to, to a mutually understandable agreement. If you don't buy any of that, you don't buy the idea of free speech. Now, what you buy instead, if you're playing radical left identity politics, is something completely different, completely, utterly different, which is that your conception of yourself as a sovereign individual is an illusion. Um, and for the case, for, for most of the people in this room, it's not only an illusion, it's a, it's a, it's a delusion that you support only because of the privilege and power that that confers upon you. You don't have individual opinions because all you are is an avatar or a mouthpiece for your group identity, whether you know it or like it or not. That's all you're capable of mouthing. And what you see in the world is nothing but a Hobbesian battleground of identity politics, groups, battling for supremacy. And there's no communication between them. And this is part of what drives arguments such as um, the criticisms of, say, cultural appropriation, or the idea that, like, that it's improper for, a fiction author, for an author of fiction to attempt to inhabit the imagination, the, the being of, of, say, if you're a man, to inhabit the being of a woman, or if you're white, to inhabit the being of someone who's black. That you're, you're, you're walking across lines that it's not possible to walk across because you're, in, you're outside of your bailiwick. You're outside of your group identity. And there's no communication possible between people of different of, of group identities. And so what's under assault on campuses is actually the idea of the communication between people of different groups at all levels. And, and one of the things that's so terrible about that, and I think the intersectional types have stumbled upon this stupidly and without noticing, is that because we have a plethora of group identities, I think it's possible in the case of most people to identify at least eight cardinal group identities, Everyone is a unique combination of their group identities, and therefore no one is able to communicate with anyone else. And so what's, what's under assault is the idea of, well, not only the idea that the past is worthwhile, that it has something to teach us because we're historical creatures, that we need to extract as much wisdom as we possibly can from those who were kind enough to hand down what they learned to us, but the very idea that negotiated communication between people of equivalent worth is even possible. And so I think people, especially the people who look at this as a political battle, radically underestimate the depth of the, of the, of the ideational clash that's actually in play. I mean, the most fundamental conceptions of our civilization are what are under direct assault by the unholy alliance between the postmodernists and the, and the modified Marxists. Let's what I see, though, too, is it's a very odd thing. On the one hand, a lot of the current campus uh, dysfunctions and sicknesses is a instantiation of a very pseudo-sophisticated discourse of post-structuralism and uh, the, you know, the spawn of, of uh, Derrida and Foucault. At the same time, you mentioned cultural appropriation, which is truly 
one of the most civilization destroying concepts to have come out of the campus left. And it is based on an extraordinarily primitive idea of the self as something that is somehow contaminated. Is, 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 there's a sort of an essence there that is authentic and can be stolen. You know, that you can steal my identity through language, uh, or a name can steal an identity. It's a very bizarre thing, and it's, it's a blindness to the fact that one of the beauties of, of human society is the role playing. It's irony, it's wit, it's the fact that human beings take on different roles at different times. Castiglione wrote a book, the Il, Il Cortigiano, the courtier, talking about what it is for an aristocrat, how he should bear himself. And he talks about sprezzatura, the sort of a lightness of being that should be our ideal of an, an awareness of, of play, of, of possibility. And these campus yahoos uh, are, are unable to think of differences of degree. At this very moment, there is a Harvard law professor who is being investigated by the Harvard bureaucrats because he has the temerity to represent the accused sexual predator Harvey Weinstein. He also oversees a Harvard undergraduate dorm. And the students at Harvard under his tutelage at the dorm had a complete nervous breakdown because somehow he, by representing, by serving in a professional role of representing Harvey Weinstein, he is somehow carrying into the dorm the essence of rape. And they're unable to understand that, no, he's playing a role that is essential in due process, in restraining the potentially tyrannical power of the state, without which we have no guarantees of justice. And yet these students think of this Ronald Sullivan's professor as somehow a bearer of the essence of, of rape culture uh, because they have an extraordinarily primitive view of, of what it is to be a human being. Well, it's a fragile view. It's fragile. You know, and, and, the, and the question, at least in part, is like, what, what accounts for the fragility? Yeah. They're, they're, they're so defensive. It's Fred, but you know, I don't quite buy the fragility argument, which is saying it's just like snowflakes and they're overparented. I think what's at stake here is ideological war. I should have said shallowness then. Okay, right. I think that they are, they are using the language of psychological fragility for something that is far more dangerous and, and, and malign. Uh, which is to pick, try pick and take down Western civilization. So, you, well, you've, you've both alluded to how the, 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 the dominant views on the academy have far more uh, widely reaching consequences than that which is simply contained. There's often a critique to, some people would say, well, it's just the ivory tower, it's a kind of sequestered problem, it's contained in a certain sense, it, 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 has, it has borders. But, I, but both of you, it seems to me, have a, a keen sense that what happens in the university spreads, in fact, in a certain sense, is, is, is distributed or disseminated principally from the university to everywhere else. And I'm wondering if you could each say a few words about the consequences for however you might characterize those dysfunctions, those maladies internally in the university, what their consequences are, both psychologically for the student and then broader culturally, whether artistically, politically, or otherwise? Well, let us count the ways. I mean, there's probably a day goes by that is not some real world uh, manifestation of academic victim politics. Uh, right now, we have this absurd crusade going on of, of former Vice President Joe Biden for acting like a normal human being, for acting like an older man who is a politician and is physical and puts his, uses his hands to express himself. I have not seen a single image yet that comes anywhere close to sexual predation. And yet we're going through this massive meltdown because somehow he's engaged in rape culture. 
look at the hysteria that greeted this incident of the boys from a Catholic school in Covington, Kentucky, who were visiting uh, the Washington Monument and happened to f get in between a uh, battle between some kooky black nationalist extremists and some Native American activists. And there was one image that was caught that was a boy exercising enormous self-restraint as an Indian activist pounds his drum right in his face that was seized upon by the elites as the very embodiment of white patriarchal cis-normative privilege. And for a few days, there was an ecstatic uh, self-indulgence in finally we've got a real world example of, of white male privilege until the story fell apart. We are also seeing the STEM fields in Silicon Valley, meritocracy is under assault. Mm -hmm. The assumption, the reigning assumption of academic identity politics is that, well, there's three. That gonads and melanin are the most important things about a human being, that discrimination based on gonads and melanin are the defining features of, of American society, and any disparity in proportional representation, be it of females and males or of different minority and ethnic groups in any American institution, is by definition the result of discrimination against females and minorities. So what does this mean for the STEM fields? It means that every single big tech company, whether it's Google or Microsoft, uh, are twisting themselves into knots to try to hire to create gender equity. There was a, a, a HR manager at YouTube <coughs> who was fired because he refused to go along with the edict from on high to interview only females, blacks, and Hispanics for entry-level engineering jobs. Who knows how many highly qualified white or Asian males were passed over that could have given us some breakthrough in, say, energy efficiency to take on uh, climate change because these tech firms are now putting obeisance to the demands of identity politics above meritocratic hiring. So, so there's something that's, that's really crucial about, about the idea of the assault on, on meritocracy. Because I think one of the defining features of the campus pathology is in fact an assault on the idea of competence itself. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I, I've been trying to untangle the, the logic behind that, to, to lay it out, and, and at the same time trying to understand how we might define when the left goes too far. This has actually been a technical problem. Like we, we all understand, if we have a modicum of knowledge about the 20th century, that the left can clearly go too far. Um, we obviously know that the right can go too far, and the conditions under which the right can go too far seem to be fairly well understood. And they tend to involve claims of superiority, in intrinsic superiority based on group identity. That's the, the dividing line, I think, for the pathology of the right. For the pathology of the left, it's much more difficult. It's, it's, it, it seems like it's more like a combination of ideas that produce a kind of t genocidal toxicity if they're left to run to their full extent. But, but of all those vague ideas that cause immense trouble, the most deadly is the notion that unequal outcomes are evidence of uh, systemic oppression. It, it's, it's pathological first because it denies the idea that there are intrinsic differences between people that may play a role in those differences in outcome that are independent of oppression and prejudice. Now, we, we should say as reasonably intelligent people that hierarchies, meritocratic or not, are prone to their various pathologies and to their corruption by power, and that it certainly is the case 
that throughout history and even now the most qualified person doesn't necessarily get the job and that's often for reasons that have nothing to do with their qualifications so they're discriminated against for prejudicial reasons that happens with less attractive people for example it happens with shorter people, it happens with people who are more introverted. There's, there's many, many reasons why the best person doesn't necessarily get the job. But to say that that happens sometimes is not anything like saying that that's the characteristic function of the hierarchies of the functional West. It, it seems to me to, to be self-evident that most of the organizations that we have put together with such great difficulty are unbelievably functional remarkably or even miraculously functional and that it's unquestionable that a large proportion of them are devoted to solving problems that everyone wants to have solved I mean people who take care of the, the sewage for example are a good example of that I mean we actually do take care of our bodily waste that actually works we actually have electrical systems power systems that function we have infrastructure that is reliable I mean, our society works and what and everyone's happy about that because everyone recognizes that well it's not so good to freeze in the winter and and to die of heat prostration in the summer and it's not so good to walk you know in 10 inches of filth like you might have in London in 1750 and and we organized structures that take care of those problems and we all see that at least to some degree the reason that these organizations work is because we have encouraged allowed and rewarded the people who are capable of running organizations of that sort to actually be the ones that run them hence the meritocracy so, and one of the consequences of that, in combination with the fact that there are intrinsic differences between people, is that there isn't equality of outcome. And another contributor, of course, is that it's impossible for there to be equality of outcome because you can almost infinitely subdivide people into their various group memberships, and so it's technically impossible to equalize outcomes across all possible relevant group membership domains which is actually a great thing for the radical left because it means that they have an inexha inexhaustible supply of potentially prejudicial attitudes to complain about um, the, 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 the most interesting example of this I would say probably comes from Scandinavia so you may know that there are a series of studies um, deemed by the London Times to be among the most reliable psychological studies ever produced because of their magnitude and because of, the, of their rep, 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 replicability they've been replicated dozens of times and because the findings themselves were a shock to the scientists who discovered them they weren't what was expected which is another hallmark of I would say validity in science if you discover something and you really wish it wasn't true then it probably is <laughs> and so what happened over the last 30 years was that it has become increasingly obvious that a substantial proportion of the difference in outcome between men and women with regards to career position and income is actually a consequence of temperamental differences between men and women and the temperamental differences the most important temperamental differences seem to be in agreeableness a big five personality trait and negative emotion another big five personality trait but also in interest because the largest psychological difference between men and women that has been discovered is the proclivity to be interested in people which is a feminine trait or things which is a masculine trait and what's so fascinating about that and so completely unexpected and truly shocking truly shocking to psychologists as it was laid out because they're as left-leaning as the campus intellectuals are in general was that the more egalitarian the society 
the bigger the differences in temperament so the largest differences in temperament between men and women in the world are in the Scandinavian countries followed closely by countries like Holland and that those differences are driving substantively driving differences in outcome especially in uh, let's say in the proclivity to become an engineer versus a nurse and that a fair bit of that is driving what relatively small differences there are in average pay by sex and so the Scandinavians are I lectured in Scandinavia a number of times this year and I presented most of the audiences I talked to with the Scandinavian paradox which is that as you increase as you level the playing field and maximize equality of opportunity which I think you could argue the Scandinavians have done better from the gender perspective than any other country whether you agree with what they've done or not you actually increase the degree to which certain outcomes are unequal and so you don't get to have your cake and eat it too that equality of opportunity and equality of outcome are by no they're not aligned or they're certainly not aligned in every way now obviously as the workforce has opened up to women some equality of opportunity has manifested itself because approximately as many women work percentage-wise as men and that's a huge transformation but there are other forms of inequality that emerge as a consequence of allowing people their free choice and so the Scandinavians now are a real conundrum technically speaking um, they face a number of difficult choices one is just to disbelieve the research which is becoming increasingly difficult as the number of studies mounts and the ends the, the, the number of research subjects in the studies you know increases into the hundreds of thousands which is where it is now um, and so to deny the validity of that which, which has its consequences or to double down on the idea that we are social we're socially constructed right to the core and start to become positively totalitarian in your attempt to eradicate the remaining differences let's say between boys and girls which is something that's definitely happening at least to some degree in Scandinavia where they're attempting for example to eradicate what appear to be intrinsic uh, preference differences between boys and girls with regards to toys and so it's an invitation like we could make boys and girls the same but to do so we would do substantial damage to both of them and we would enable or create a bureaucracy the likes of which would 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 send chills down the spine of anyone with with any sense and with any and with any knowledge of history yeah it's very very scary and let's you ask Stephen about the real world consequences let's note that uh, Google fired a young perfectly competent computer engineer named James Damore in August of 2017 for saying precisely invoking precisely the research that you did and he had poor guy was so naive that he used one of the big five psychological traits unconsciously and self-consciously which is neuroticism and this really struck the feminist ears but he said females score higher on the score of neuroticism you'd better not use that term and everybody freaked out mm -hmm. uh, but he's right I mean females are more risk averse they're more likely to see threat guys are more competitive they're more uh, risk takers sometimes to a, a massive fault mm -hmm. uh, but this is now transforming the workplace mm -hmm. and it's not just the private companies it's also basic research mm -hmm. uh, you have the National Science Foundation, which is the United States' premier funder of academic basic research founded in 1950 by Congress to give us a fighting chance with compete with the Soviets. And they are now spending Americans' taxpayer dollars giving it to gender theorists to do studies of intersectionality in engineering. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to wrap one's mind around this. Well, it's NSF also impossible. NSF giving money for intersectionality because they are determined to destroy this scientific truth. And, you know, this is a real watershed moment. Can science and the 
the arrival at empirically demonstrated truths survive politics, and if it can't, we really are going down it seems, that, it seems that road. Un, it seems unlikely to me. I mean, um, you know, we're 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 accustomed to thinking of science as a a force of almost unstoppable magnitude, but it's historically new, a couple of centuries old, mm -hmm. and we don't know the conditions under which its flourishing is possible, and the probability that we can undermine those conditions, even accidentally, is unbelievably high. Right. I mean, already in the UC systems, in order to be considered as a new hiree or to be promoted through the, through the ranks in the STEM fields, you have to write a statement describing your alignment with the, you know, the three fundamental shibboleths of the radical left, diversity, inclusivity, which I've never understood as a concept, uh, and equity. And without you making obeisance to those um, fundamental axioms, then you're not moving anywhere in your career. Right. And there's an insistence from the NSF, which I found just as jaw-dropping as you did, that we move as rapidly as possible, say, to gender equality across the STEM fields. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, is, this is, I think the scientists are so politically naive that they'll be taken out by the postmodernists in no time flat. Well, what I'm hearing from my friends in the sciences is, tragically, some of them are actually on board this. I, I have a friend uh, in the engineering department on a, on a UC campus, and their dean has been systematically tearing up their final hiring list, the short list of three candidates, saying go back to the drawing board because there's no females there. Now these are people that have been chosen based on merit. I have no doubt. I have no doubt they are not discriminating against qualified females. But they are being forced to hire females and about half of his department thinks this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the control for this, Stephen, at the very beginning you mentioned sort of market forces. Well, we are in a global economy, and for sure, the Asian countries do not give a damn about equity, diversity, and inclusion. In fact, the, the Asian students who are studying here think we're all nuts. Like, they cannot believe it. What is going on? So they are absorbing our scientific knowledge and taking it back to China. And who can blame them? You know, China is obviously well, then at has least it'll be somewhere. Somewhere, exactly, <laughs> somewhere, and they will they will continue with discovering genetic differences without the slightest shame or, or embarrassment about the consequences. It seems to me that at the at the heart of this this problem is is the assertion that there is no real world out there, whether it's uh, in the terms of the forms of the studies you talked about, uh, in terms of the underlying natural differences. It, does, it can be nature, it can be the denial that, that beauty is a real thing, that truth has any objective character, that there's any reality that exists independent of our wish or whim. And I'd like to, to move from that, you might say, that insight as a kind of uh, mode of diagnosing what is dominant in through much of the academy, as a way of, of moving towards what might be a more, po a more positive account. I want to ask the question, what is the higher of higher education? And I want to preface that with an observation of my own life, which is that the moments that have been most disruptive of my immediate self-perception in the most productive and positive ways have been encounters with something outside of myself, whether in, whether in love or beauty or truth. It could be a sunset. Uh, and I want to, to relate that to one of the books that I've spent the most time with in my life, and that's a, a book written in the, in the early sixth century by a man named Boethius at the, after the fall of the Roman Empire. And to make the story short, he had risen quite high in the Roman uh, state and empire and was accused of treason by the king. He was a very wealthy, powerful, highly educated man and thrown in prison. And after a year, 
brutally executed and killed. But in that year that he was, he was in prison, he wrote a book called The Consolation of Philosophy. It's a drama in which a woman named Philosophy comes to console a prisoner, we might say, played by himself, Boethius. And what's very striking about this, the beginning of this text, is that the prisoner is, he's, he's, in fact, he's writing a poem, and it's a really bad poem. It's all about sort of woe is me and how terrible the world is and, and that uh, there's no hope and he's lost all of these things that he thought really mattered. And it's compelling in a way. It's a true story. It happened. And then in comes this uh, woman named Philosophy, and she just comes blazing in as this, this, this irrepressible force of dynamism and illumination. And she says, essentially, she says the muses of poetry who are dictating this. She says, get out of here, you, you, you theatrical harlots, she calls them. You have no cure for this man's ills. You only make them worse. And in that moment, she, as it were, she, she just casts aside the clouds of, of, of psychological darkness and the immediacy of, of his own feelings. And it's, those were real. It was a real thing that happened. But there was no way out of it for him other than this... This, this, this casting off of his immediate perception in light of higher, realer, truer things. And so what I want to ask you both about is, you know, what is the higher that pierces through us that is not simply outside of us, but through our encounter with which we ourselves become more, more illuminated? Uh, and perhaps let's talk, answer that in a, way, in a kind of abstract way first, and then maybe we can talk about particular works of art and music and literature and philosophy that have had that role in your own lives. But what is the higher of higher education? Heather. Well, first of all, again, I am, I'm not sure that the fundamental sickness is on the left is a belief in no objective reality. On the one hand, you're right in that the characteristic of our time is this narcissism. <clears throat> Students only want to study themselves. And yet again, they are not, it's not a platonic vision that we're, you know, we're living in a shadow world and above us, outside of our perhaps current perception, our ideal forms, they really do believe that the reality is oppression. So they're not relativists when it comes to that mm -hmm. narrative. Um, that's the one part of the world that remains real. That's the one thing that's real. Yeah. And, uh, that's and why as they well need to ally the, themselves with Marxism. Right, as well as the all importance of their particular gender and race identities, which as far as I'm concerned is the least interesting part of the self. I do not regard being female as an accomplishment. It's not particularly interesting, sorry. Um, but the higher, I mean, I guess it's, I don't, I don't think so much in abstractions. To me, the higher and higher education is the particularities of a civilizational inheritance, whether it's, it's plunging into the Greek tragedies and, and trying to imagine the terrifying strangeness of these festivals of tragedies in, in, in Athens and Aeschylus's Oresteia, or it's the, the lacquered beauty of Milton's language in book four describing Paradise Lost. So it's, it's a series of the ability to lose yourself in expression that is of a gr greater sophistication and eloquence than you could possibly attain to for yourself. So that's, that's, I would say, well, that's exactly that calling to the higher self that's of, that's of absolute, of primal importance. You know, one of the things that's amused me, I would say, um, in the, in the, as I've observed the reaction of my audiences in the tour that I've done over the last year, so I've visited about 150 cities since last January, like 14 months ago, and spoken to about 300,000 people. And I've had an opportunity to watch the audiences, and I do that very carefully. Um, I don't use notes. I watch who I'm talking to, and, and I listen to their response. I watch them as individuals, and I listen to their response as a group. And 
one of the tropes that I've used fairly frequently is the following. We've had 50 years of concentration on individual rights and, and I would say the pursuit of hedonism and happiness as the goal of life. And, and also this, and, and it's probably primarily the fault of psychologists this, this notion that the right way to interact with someone if you're going to be a benefit to them with regards to their mental health is to note that they're entirely acceptable in their current form. <laughs> you're all right, the way you are. And there's a big problem with that as far as I'm concerned which is that, well, especially if you're young, which is that, well, if you're so all right the way you are, then, well, where are you headed? I mean, if, if you're already at up, <laughs> then where's the up that you're going to pursue for the next 60 years? And so that's a big problem. If you're already everything that you could be in any ethical form in, in terms of your, let's say, even your, your, your value to yourself and to other people, then, well, you don't have a future. You certainly don't need one. But even worse, there, there's something worse, which is that, well, let's say that you aren't so all right as far as you're concerned the way you are. In fact, you're not so all right at all. You're suicidal in your not all rightness. You know, you, you're... You, you see the world as an unmitigated source of suffering. You overwhelmingly tormented by the, the, the malevolence of, of existence at the individual level and the social level and the natural level, and you see no direction forward. And so your life is not without meaning because that would, be, that would actually be a relief. Your life is nothing but unmitigated suffering. And someone says to you, hey, kid, don't, don't worry about it. You're, you're perfectly fine the way you are. It's like I tell my audiences that they're not all right the way they are in any possible sense of the word, that, that there's so much more to each of them than has already been manifested that it's not, it's not even within our ken to understand, just like it's not really within our ability to understand our depth for evil. Our, our capacity for evil. Um, it's not within our ability to understand our capacity for, for good and for who we could be. And there's two reasons that that's important. One is that, well, if you start to understand that there could be a better you, well, then th that's actually psychologically meaningful because it gives, you, it gives you something to do. It gives you hope that a better future might await. And it does that technically. That's the other thing I should point out, is that most of the positive emotion that people experience is a consequence of, of us each observing ourselves moving towards a valued goal. It's not a consequence of attainment. It's not satisfaction that motivates people. It's hope. And, and, and that's technically the case. Um, there's a special neurophysiological circuit that mediates hope and it activates when it observes that you're moving towards a valued goal. And the more valued the goal and the faster your progress towards it, the more the circuit is activated. And it's, 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 it's what engages you in life and it's analgesic and it's anxiolytic. It has all of those properties. And so it's not optional to have this circuit activated. All the drugs of abuse that people rely on, activate that circuit. That's why they take those drugs. That's cocaine and the, the really addictive drugs, cocaine, heroin, the psychomotor stimulants, that's the class of drug. Um, what university is for, what higher education is for, is to call you to that. It's, it's to make you more than you are. And, and, and first, maybe that means that you need to understand who you are, and you're a historical creature. I mean, and this is something that even the people on the left are duty bound to agree with. You are a socially constructed being in many ways. You're a product of history. And so you need to understand history because history is actually about you. The, 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 the great corpus of civilized works is your autobiography. And so if you're ignorant of it, you don't know 
who you are or where you are. And, and so how can you orient yourself possibly in the world without that knowledge? Not knowing who you are or where you are. You're, you have a map, but you have no idea where you're located on it. And so you're disoriented. And so I always tell my students when we talk about anything that's historically, that anything of historical import is, well, why study history? It's like, this is you. You don't understand. It's like the Nazis, they were you. The, the Jews in Auschwitz, they were you. This is about you. And the less you know about you, the less armored you are for the world. And you better be armored for the world because the world is a very rough place. It's a place of sorrow and suffering and malevolence. And the less prepared you are for that, the worse for you and for everyone else. So you better wake up. And people understand that put that way. And, and then the, the higher is also, well, it isn't only a matter of knowing who you are. It's a matter of envisioning who you could be and strategizing how you might achieve that. And, and what do you have to do and know to be able to do that? Well, you, you need some knowledge of aesthetics. Like, what's the beautiful? What's the good? What's the noble? What's, what's of worth? You know, I talk to my audiences of nobility, which is very strange. It's a word you never hear. You should have a noble goal, right? Something that, 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 that can be of comfort to you when you wake up in the middle of the night and ask yourself about the validity of your being. I'm pursuing this goal of sufficient nobility to justify the inequity of my existence. It's a solace. It's not optional. And so you get educated to find out about what the ideal is. And so then you can orient yourself towards that. And then that gives you hope. And, and the hope that can sustain you through catastrophe. And catastrophe is coming. So you better have something to sustain you through it. That's education. And then there's writing and thinking. It's like my students, I, they, they'll write an essay. I, I wrote this little treatise that I put on the web that many people are using about how to write an essay. And I start out psychologically. It's like, well, essay means attempt. It's like, okay, well, why are you writing an essay? Well, let's think about it ethically for a moment. Well, first of all, you should have a problem. That should be the first issue. It's like, you, you need a problem if you're going to write an essay, because the essay is an attempt to answer a problem. And if you're playing the game properly, well, then it's kind of incumbent upon you to pick a problem that you would actually like to have an answer for. You know, and students so often come to me and say, well, what topic should I write about? And I think, I'm not telling you that. It's like, that's the hard part, is to pick the problem. So pick your own damn problem. And make sure that it's one that's actually a problem. Right? That, that, you, that there's something in your soul that's calling you to grapple with. So that you're not bored into a state of, 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 what, of what, what torpor while you're scraping out your 10th rate manuscript to hand in for your class grade, but instead engaged in something that, that, that deeply affects you. It's like, this is a problem, man. This is driving me mad. I need to solve it. It's like, great, you've got a problem. You can start your damn essay. Okay, so now, why write it? Well, how about because you're trying to solve the problem? How about, how about because what you're doing is you're laying out a pattern of thought that's going to shape the way you perceive the world and act in it? Because that's what thought does, if it does anything, is it alters your perceptions and it shapes your actions. To, to write isn't some abstract luxury. It's to think in the deepest possible sense and the reason you want to do that is because you want to orient yourself in the world. And the reason that you want to do that is because if you're disoriented in the world, it will take you out. And so you better be prepared, not, not just physically. We seem to all accept that necessity, at least in principle. But intellectually, it's like prepare yourself. The worst is coming your way. And the wiser you are and the more prepared you are, the better you're going to be able to cope with it when it arrives. And so sharpen yourself up. And the way you do that is you pay attention to every damn word you write. Every word. You see how it's embedded in every phrase. 
You look at how every phrase relates to every other phrase within every sentence. You look at how the sentences combine together to make paragraphs that are coherent and logical. You sequence the paragraphs so that they tell a coherent and profound story. And you incorporate that and you transform your perceptions and you change the way you live. And that's the purpose of being educated. And that's the, that's the purpose of the humanities. It's like, find out who you are. Find out how you could be. Lay out a strategy. Sharpen yourself up and start to become who you could be. And, and then the, the end of that is, it isn't merely that it's necessary for you to be who you could be. Because that would be good for you and because it would be good for your family and because it would be good for your community. That's all self-evident. But there's something worse even, which is, if you don't do that, if you don't bring what is within you to fruition, and you allow yourself to be less than you are, the, the, the bitterness that accompanies that, the sense of loss and failure and, 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 and absent opportunity, corrupts you. And then that corruption brings into the world something that should not be. And even if you're not animated by the hope that you could make the world a better place as a consequence of sharpening yourself up intellectually and morally, you should at least be animated by the knowledge that, and this is the knowledge that anyone who has any historical wisdom at all possesses, is that the, the space that you could have filled with what was good will definitely be filled with what is evil. And the purpose of education is to, it's to tilt the scales, right? It's to tilt the scales at the individual level away from what's pathological and corrupt and resentful and vengeful, vengeful and destructive and towards what's good and true and courageous and noble. And none of that's just words, not if it's not if you're not using it in the cliched sense, not if you understand the connection between your soul, your spirit, the words you use, and the manner that you manifest yourself in the world. And that's the purpose of higher education. It's to make citizens, right? It's to make noble citizens. And it's an idea that we're we're so far from comprehending now that that no one I talk to has ever even heard that. So Well, these are very <clears throat> profound and inspiring thoughts. I want to add the substratum of technique underneath them. You're confronting the vast tragedy, in some sense, just simply of student writing, and the inability to structure something coherently, a mastery of language. Underlying this journey that you're describing to move out of yourself or your current petty self into a larger self that is infused by knowledge of human possibility is also the simple mechanics of absorbing mechanisms of expression. And it used to be that it was assumed that if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a writer, you study the models of the past. And every single painter went, and he spent hours copying in museums, because the assumption that he was somehow autochthonous, you know, born from the, the seeds without fathers, without, without an ancestor, was absurd. You step in the shoes of greatness, mm -hmm and you learn through learning what your predecessors did. And now we have this idea that people simply go out and they express the wonderful uniqueness that is them, and that that is itself validates their in, inarticulate and inchoate attempts to express themselves. No, I and think we that's have part lost, of that. We have lost that understanding that Learning is also about uh, discipline. You also speak quite rightly and eloquently about close reading. You're saying read your own prose uh, and, and listen, does that sentence have anything to do with normal syntactic structure and do the sentences follow? 
But I would also say one thing that I'm very grateful for in my education, even though it was I spent way too much time absorbing deconstruction and post-structuralism when I should have been simply reading more novels, but I was still a benefactor of the Yale tradition of close reading of the new criticism, and I learned to pay extraordinary attention to every single word in a text. I could write 25 pages on 12 lines of Wordsworth's prelude because I was observing every single one of those words and how they related to others, perhaps to a fault. Perhaps I was making things up. But, but I think that an attention to things outside of the self is also extraordinarily crucial. And, and I would also say, you mentioned Nietzsche at the beginning as adumbrating our current malaise in, in what would happen if we lose a sense of a transcendent ideal. But I, I think another way of understanding what's going on in, in education today is, is a concept that the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur articulated. He talked about the hermeneutics of suspicion. And he traced those to, and that is a sense of reading texts or reading human creations with seeing them as subtexts, as, as guarding uh, un, unacceptable truths and that, that the surface of things is a bunch of lies. And so the characteristic hermeneutics of suspicion, which he attributed to Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, was to see the products of human civilization as mere masks for power, mm -hmm. for the unbounded ego as opposed to rationality, and for the oppressive workings of the economy uh, and power relations between capitalists and, and the proletariat rather than a functioning, uh, mutually beneficial free market. I, and I we, are, we are now approaching civilization exclusively through the hermeneutics of suspicion. And he contrasted that to the hermeneutics of faith, which was involved in trying to recuperate the meaning of text in sympathy with the author's intentions rather than reading against it. If I could pick up on, the, on, that, ver on that very question. That is to say, paradoxically, that which realizes us in a higher or fuller or more complete way requires a stance of humility, right. of attending to that which is outside of you, yep. uh, whether, it's, whether, it's, whether it's a text, a piece of music, could be just the reality of your life in any, any number of ways. But so far as education is concerned, I'd love to have both of you speak about encounters in your own lives, edu edu whether educationally or aesthetically, with objects of art or philosophy or literature or science <laughs> that have done that very, that, that have engaged you in that, in that very way to, to awaken you. You know, if one of the ways that we might think of, of, the, of the, the viewpoint that you're all right on your own is reflected precisely in terms of the way uh, students are, are taught to write, that it's all just in you, you know, just, just emote and, you know, what are your opinions about this, as if anyone really cares. And that as leads, if you have opinions. As if you even have opinions. And that leads to a kind of you know, narcissism, to a sort of solipsistic subjectivity, out of which there is no, there is no, there is no exit. And, uh, and simultaneously, to, uh, to what I take to be a, a, kind of, a kind of group think. I mean, if there's one thing that you can say about the university today, it's that you can very often predict the opinions that people will come out with who think that they have learned to think critically. I mean, there's a famous entrepreneur who interviews people, and one of the questions he asks is, is tell me two or three things you believe that virtually none of your peers believe. And, it is, and, it, it is, and, and this is the, the difficulty of finding answers to that question uh, is proof of how far our universities have, have strayed from being able to cultivate a genuine independence of mind. And so I, I, I want to come back to encounters that you have that you have each had with texts, or however you might want to construe it, um, that have been illuminating and enlarging and have cultivated for you something of the independence of mind that both of you are so notorious for. Heather. 
Well, I actually, again, I, I don't think, and th I may be completely blind in this, I don't think independence of mind is, is what I would put as the goal for education. For me, it is the transmission of an inheritance. Mm. If we don't read these authors, they die. It is on us. It is on the faculty to inspire students with the sense of excitement, of terror. Are they up to these works? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are they worthy of them? Do they possess the attention and the knowledge to possibly confront the Oresti and know what is going on? So the idea that it's ultimately about freeing the self, I suppose that ultimately you are right and that you need to be able to talk to students about the goal here is for you to live a life that is more open to your own possibilities and those of others still for me we are so far from understanding the primary responsibility which is to keep this tradition alive well don't don't, don't get me wrong like i don't believe that and, and this is something this is a transformative moment, I suppose, for me, is that one of the things I learned from Nietzsche was that there's no freedom without a very long previous period of voluntary slavery, right? right? Is that what you do is it's yes. an apprenticeship. Right. That's right. You, 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 you go in on your knees exactly. if you're lucky. Right. And you think, I know nothing. Let me be worthy of this. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, then, and then if you're fortunate, you, you have in, in the university, you have the opportunity to choose for your peers those who have been nominated by, by the entire sequence of your ancestral past as worthy of yep. preservation. Right. You, can, you, can, you can knock on the door of that club and, and be let in, at yep. least as an observer. And it's an unbelievable privilege. Exactly. And the scandal is these students are being given a license for ignorance. I was at Yale recently, at a dinner with students, and one student said with utter confidence, not a slightest hint of, of, of embarrassment or shame, I don't like reading white males. And he was referring to Homer, but this encompassed the entirety of white males. And he was shameless about this, and he actually invoked the authority of a Yale professor who I doubt he misinterpreted who had said she no longer uh, can teach Ovid because it is so, uh, she, she only s understands it now. It's, it, she cannot get beyond the violence to women to, un to appreciate the beauty of the language. Students, I hear again and again, are being given a license to reject that which they are completely unworthy of, and it's heartbreaking. Well, and this is, this is associated with two things we already talked about, and one is, the insistence that the West is an oppressive patriarchy, and also the assault on meritocracy. Because if there's no meritocracy, there's obviously no works that are classic. Right. And, and if there's no works that are classic, well then the motivations of those who wrote the classics or who preserved them is obviously up for that skepticism that you described. And what you see happening is that all the wheat is reduced to chaff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, when I introduce my students, let's say, to Freud or to Nietzsche, um, and I use those two because they're notorious thinkers in some ways, and, and I, 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 I try to instill in them the conviction that their job is to read with discrimination, is to understand that this is not all truth and not all value, that, that, that what's useful and profound has to be extracted out of the text as a consequence of careful reading, right? And the, and the rest, the errors that are, are, are a necessary part of any, even any endeavor of genius have to be let go. But the trick is to pull the weed out and to leave the chaff behind, not to say, well, it's all chaff and therefore only a fool would bother with the endeavor. And that's certainly what students are taught. I'm, I'm amazed, constantly amazed, at the degree to which students are willing. I taught a course on, on, on an introductory course on religious thinking one year to undergraduates. And it, the degree to which 
an, an 18-year-old freshman would come into class and announce, you know, triumphantly that there was nothing of worth in the entire history of Christianity <laughs> was just breathtaking. It's like, well, that's blindness blindness. That, that, that's a, that's a, a, a relatively new psychological concept. Uh, it's the, it, 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 technically, it's, there are levels of ignorance that are so deep that they are unable to recognize themselves. You know so little about what you're talking about that you can't even tell that you don't know anything about it. And, and then the unmitigated gall of that attitude, it's like, really, this is, this is how you construe yourself. You're, you're, you're 18. You've read nothing. Yeah. You know nothing. You've done nothing. You've been dependent on other people your entire life. And yet, somehow, the consequence of your movement through the educational system is your absolutely confident pronouncement that there's nothing whatsoever of worth in the entire history of Western Christianity, just to take a single example. And I've so never like, heard a faculty member rebut that without some puling qualification about respect for diversity. This is what is so infuriating and appalling, is that these ideas, this contempt for greatness, it's, it's not coming out of nowhere. They are being fed this and given license for this ignorance by their professors. Well, that's because they have very many professors who are, and maybe this is particularly true of literary criticism, who are Cain-like in their envy of genuine greatness. And they've gone from critics who admire the literary canon to those who are resentful for their own inability to, to contribute to it and perfectly motivated to tear it down. Well, you did have Harold Bloom elevating the act of reading to that of the equal of the author with the you know, anxiety of influence, with, but that he was referring to himself, really. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, it's again, it's the hermeneutics of suspicion that we are going to deconstruct these texts rather than finding in them what is beautiful. Uh, so so what, well, just one question. This is, look, why, given that, and I, I agree with what you're saying, and this is a great mystery to me, is that, and, and it relates to something you said about the postmodernist belief in, the, in some externalities in the world. It's like nothing's real, nothing's of value. Except power. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is that the single external reality that the radicals all agree constitutes the ultimate reality? It's like, I don't understand that. It's like, there is, people have criticized me and say, well, you can't be, you, you talk about postmodern neo Marxists, you can't be postmodernist and Marxist. It's like, well, I know that, but. The people who are postmodernist and Marxist don't seem to know that. I mean, because they've rejected meta narratives, but they turn to this dialectic of nothing's real, nothing's reliable, everything functions as a consequence of tyranny and power. Those things are real. It's like, why? I, I don't understand that. What's, what's the metaphysics of the, of the, of the faith in, in that reality of tyranny and power? I understand it as a product of the West's self-critical guilt that it took us a long time, say, in the United States to come to terms with our original sin of, of slavery and, and its long aftermath. And, and now we have swung over into the opposite where we somehow are unwilling to hold universal standards to all, all groups. We had the concept in the 1960s of blaming the victim. You cannot, if you, if you identify a victim group, you cannot hold that victim group up to the same bourgeois standards as you expect out of your own children. Uh, and, and so the narrative that is acceptable currently to explain ongoing socioeconomic disparities, the only acceptable narrative is that there remains sub rosa uh, endemic discrimination going on, even though that's demonstrably false. It's empirically demonstrably false because there is not a single mainstream institution in the United States that is not favoring 
uh, underrepresented minorities or females. I think you know, I, go ahead. Oh, I was only going to say, because I know we need to draw to a close soon, I was only going to say that, that uh, relative to, to, to Jordan, your question, it needs to be said that the, the, the claims of power or the damage that unchecked power can do have been one of the principal sources of investigation of great minds throughout an entire history, mm -hmm. and that what to do about the problems of the unchecked power of the self, uh, whether in, under the form of original sin or on the limits of power politically, or however else we might construe this, this is, this is actually one of the great yeah. focuses of human investigation mm -hmm. for all of history. And I don't think there's any question, and certainly, Jordan, you've often said that where that position leads is to a kind of nihilism, that uh, if there is only power and there is nothing else, uh, then uh, we're in a, a dark space indeed. But I want to conclude on an optimistic note, and that is to simply note that there appears to me, not only because I've observed, Jordan, your, your worldwide lectures and how eagerly your, your words are, 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 are drunk up by people seeking meaning and truth, honesty about the difficulties of life, but pointing towards ways of discovering deep and true and beautiful animating realities. I know that this conversation is likely to be seen by many such people who themselves would love to know what are works you can point them to that you have been brought to your knees by the beauty or truth of. Give us a few examples and say a few words about them. Well, Musically, in high school, I encountered Bach's St. Matthew Passion for the first time, and it was something unlike anything I'd ever experienced. The grandeur, the pathos, the, the sorrow, and the catharsis of moving through that work with its, its choruses of unbelievable power and strength, its solos of, of heart-wrenching beauty, with the, one of the final uh, arias in the work, uh, a bass aria, Mache dich mein Herz rein, make, make yourself pure, my heart, because I'm going to bury Jesus in you. Get the recording, get Dietrich Fischer Dieskau singing that. It's, it's, it's beyond belief. In college, I discovered the Great Performers series had a performance of Mozart's Don Giovanni from the Met. This was with James Morris and Jan Joan Sutherland. I was smitten for three months. I was, I was simply walking around absolutely in complete erotic love with Don Giovanni, but because of the music, because of the, the grandeur, the nobility, the, the drive. Uh, in literature, my experiences are tied up with my professors. Again, I had the, the great privilege of a professor of Greek literature who could bring alive the Athenian festivals. Uh, I had a fantastic professor for, for the Inferno, for Dante's uh, Commedia that was infused with theory but with a knowledge of, of uh, the complexity of medieval theology and, and politics. George Eliot's Middlemarch uh, is a extraordinary act of language in its precision of understanding the challenges of interpreting human behavior and striving for a moral understanding of human experience. Uh, and I'll throw out something that's much lighter for uh, just a sheer verbal tour de force, uh, Max Beerbohm's Zulika Dobson of uh, a Edwardian uh, tale of a beautiful woman who comes to Oxford and destroys the entire university. Uh, but the language is at the height of ripe, luscious, enameled uh, expression of the greatest resources of English literature of which we are so fortunate to be native speakers. And we should never uh, underestimate what is available to us in its riches. Jordan. Well, I have a list of those books 
most of them for me have been books. Um, although I love music, I, I think the music that's most affected me was also Bach. Uh, Brandenburg concertos in, in particular, especially the third one, which, which is, uh, it's a, every time I hear it, it's a, it's a revelation of a kind of ordered miracle. Like I regard music as the most representative of all art forms because music speaks of everything in a musical piece is a part that exists in relationship to a harmonious whole, right? And it, and it has its own intrinsic reason for being, and it speaks of meaning. You know, and I, I don't think people can live without music for that reason. And it's, and it's, and it's opaque to <clears throat> cynicism, which is also something so remarkable about... I mean, I, I don't think that's true of any other art form, but music... I've never met anyone cynical about music, and, and that's really something, you know. Um, books... I have a book list on my website, and as I would say, maybe 50 or 60 books. And um, that's been fun because many people have visited that site and have bought the books. And, 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 and many, many thousands of copies of the books. It's, it's, it's actually been a very successful endeavor, so that's quite entertaining, especially given that some of the books are extraordinarily difficult. But some of them have been works of science. I, I read a book when I was a, a graduate student called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety, which was written by a, a scientist, an English scientist, Jeffrey Gray. And that damn book just about killed me, man. I mean, he, <laughs> Gray, was a student of Hans Eysenck, who was the most cited psychologist who ever lived. And he was unbelievably educated. I mean, I don't know how many references there are in The Neuropsychology of Anxiety, maybe 2,000, 2,500 scientific papers and difficult neurophysiology, psychopharmacology, um, animal behavior, hardcore psychological and biological science. And he read all those papers. He didn't just cite them, and he understood them, and he integrated them into this great book, which, which took me deeper into the structure of the human brain and, and the psyche than I'd ever gone. And it was a six-month read, you know, because there was something that I needed to learn in every sentence. And so it, it was lovely to go through that, and it was a, a life-changing experience, uh, and it, it had a huge effect on the way that I thought from then on. And even though the book was written in 1982, um, psychologists are still catching up with it, um, and usually reading it very badly, by the way, partly because it's so difficult. Um, I, I, the works of Carl Jung absolutely f floored me. Uh, when, when I started to understand, and, and, and the psychoanalysts in general did this, when I started to understand what it meant that you were not the master in your own house, when I actually started to, to understand that as a psychological reality, that, that we are inhabited in some sense by, by, by partial personalities that are autonomous, they have their own motivation. They have their own viewpoints. And you can tell that because you can't control yourself. You do things that you wouldn't do. You do things that you shouldn't do. And you certainly don't do things that you should do. And so there are these dynamic forces at play within you. And the psychoanalysts, Jung in particular, helped me understand two things. One was those things were alive. The second was they had, they had a historical reality, historical and biological reality. They were, they were shaped by culture and they were deeply biologically rooted. And they, were, and they played the same role inside of you that the ancient Greek gods played for the Greeks. And, and, and that's the situation that we're in. And so that was an absolute revelation. I've never, I've never recovered from that. And, and Dostoevsky's um, investigation of morality in crime and punishment, the the, the, the masterful way that he sets up the rationale for the murder. Because Dostoevsky, and, and this is something that makes his writing so remarkable, always makes his enemies stronger than his allies. So when you read a book by Dostoevsky and, and he's investigating a complex concept, he makes those people who make the arguments that he wants not to be true those who are the most powerful characters with the best arguments. And so he sets out Raskolnikov, who comes up with, 
a detailed rationale for a murder, like as, as good a rationale for a murder as you might need to commit one. And then he has him undertake the murder and he gets away with it. And then the study and the entire novel from then on is the study of what happens when you go somewhere that you didn't know existed, when you thought you were more than you were. You know, for Dostoevsky, Raskolnikov had violated a fundamental ethical law, something real. And he ended up in something indistinguishable from hell. And, and, be, and, and, and Crime and Punishment makes that, makes that unbelievably real and, and in an incredibly exciting manner. Like, it's a great thriller, it's a great detective novel, and it's unbelievably deep. And it just flattened me when I read it. And I, I would say the last one, I mean, there's many, but... The last one was likely Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which was just, you cannot read that book and come out the same person. It's not possible. Um, and it was the book that really finally convinced me that the destiny of, that destiny itself was a function of the ethical conduct of the individual. Because not only did Solzhenitsyn demolish the intellectual and ethical credibility of Marxism, although you'd never guess that now, he also made an incredibly strong case that even an ideology as powerfully attractive and pathological as Marxism couldn't find its, its home and wreak its havoc without the willingness of individual citizens to falsify the nature of their own experience and to lie in word and action, and that the proper, the proper pathway forward, if, you're con if your fundamental conviction is opposition to tyranny and hopelessness, is actually truth manifested at the individual level. And so those are books that had, well, in, in, incalculable effects on me, transformed the way that I thought completely and permanently and, and hopefully for the better. I don't think we need to look, in my view, we don't need to look much further for an antidote to the malaise and dysfunctions of so much that we see in higher education than the testimony you both have just given to those works of beauty, power and truth in your own lives. Regrettably, our time has come to an end. Join me in thanking Jordan and Heather for the love they have shared with us and that has animated their learning and their courageous defense of the beauty that they see around them and in the works they have studied. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.